the EMS Nation podcast. I'm your host, Faison Arshad. We continue our NAEMT series coming from the World Trauma Symposium at the previous EMS World Expo from Las Vegas. This episode is titled Nuances and Challenges to Modern Day Disaster Triage. And this lecture is a compassionate and empathic delivery given by a very good friend of mine, Brad Newberry, who's a paramedic and hosts a school for paramedicine in the Massachusetts area and is also on the faculty of the Harvard Disaster Medicine Fellowship. Now, Brad also I know very well because he was one of the authors of the All Hazards Disaster Response course and brought a tremendous wealth of experience to that course and really gives an impassioned talk on disaster management, some of the nuances, training protocols, limitations, and future directions of disaster triage. Would love for you guys to take a listen. Let us know what your thoughts are. Reach out to us on Twitter and certainly enjoy this episode from World Trauma Symposium. Thanks for the courtesy from NAEMT. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here in such a distinguished panel that we've had so far today. And and I do truly appreciate... um, your attention this afternoon. We're going to talk about something that's that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, one of the hats that I do wear is um, I work for the Disaster Medicine Fellowship uh, at Harvard for the Beth Israel Hospital, and we do a number of uh, research projects. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research that we do in, in triage, and we, st- we have an ongoing uh, triage research project that we'll talk a little bit about, but we can't really divulge some of the uh, the outcomes yet because the, uh, the project's not complete. But I think we have to take a journey first. And that journey has to start with managing our resources. I have no disclosures. These are my views and opinions. They don't represent my department. I am a career fire officer in a, in a department just south of Boston, so um, I had to put that in there. I put some learning objectives in there for the, the CAPSI folks, just so that uh, they're happy to as well. Are you ready to respond to your next disaster or terror event in your community? Now, I looked around at the, the conference today, and I saw a number of individuals from a pretty eclectic background all across America. I saw small towns, larger cities, physicians, nurses, EMTs, and paramedics. Have you really thought about this? Many of you do some introspection and say, yes, I've thought a lot about it. I know I think about it all the time. In my role at the fellowship, you know, one of the things being so close with some of the docs, I have to tell you, there's a lot of things that keep me up at night, especially when it comes to terror events. We haven't really, you know, in our country, we've seen some terror events that just here in Las Vegas recently, the, the, the terror event that we had here, but we haven't seen a Sea Bernie event. Some of those really scare me. We haven't seen uh, some, of the, some of the types of terror events that we've had across the world. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what happened in Paris and Brussels and London. Last week, we had a uh, a major disaster medicine conference in Boston where we had some of the leading experts around the world come and talk about uh, managing some of these disasters. And before we can talk about triage, I think it's critically important that we take that journey first before we actually ever get to you as the first responder going to that event in your ambulance, in your fire truck, and what do you do when you get there? First, let's talk about defining a disaster. Many of you come from some small towns out there. I saw some big cities too as well. And really, it's about how you perceive the disaster. A train derailment that injures 15 people in a large city or urban environment, that's not really a disaster to them. They might be able to handle that very simply. But in a small community that has one ambulance and one fire truck, that now becomes a disaster. Because my good friend, Dr. Greg Seatone, defines disaster in his book as disasters are local events where the same medical personnel who provide health care on a daily basis also assume the responsibility of providing care to patients with illness or injury resulting from that disaster. These are you folks. You're the ones who are going to have to manage this incident. Are you prepared for it? See, all disasters are local. 
that, at least they start off that way. All man-made disasters are local. Now we can see natural disasters, hurricanes, and we've seen them especially this year. They can be planned for, you have some time, but all of a sudden when you have a man-made disaster or a terror event, there was no real planning. Those disasters become local problems. Whatever your community response is, that's what's going to go. I know my department, we're a small, a small city just south of Boston. We have about 40,000 people in our community. Two, we have two stations, and we run about 6,000 calls a year. And I know that I have a bunch of friends that will come when I call them. And we're going to talk about knowing what your neighbor has and what they can do for you. But initially, I know that if my, both my ambulances are tied up at the hospital, because that's a really common event, that I'm going to have a really res uh, small uh, uh, response platform that's going to go to a disaster. And in our town, we have a major rail system. We have a high-speed rail that comes through our town. We have cargo and freight that's transported across the rail system. We have a major highway where all kinds of methyl ethyl bad stuff is traveling along that highway. Tank trucks. We've had all kinds of uh, incidents out on that highway where now all of a sudden we're tasked to respond to that disaster. It comes down to preparedness. You know, I took on a, um, well, I'll get there in a minute, but think about the likelihood of disaster or a terrorist event in your community. And really, what are the resources that you have available to you right this second? Because in the first several minutes, maybe in the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depends how long it takes to get help. You're it. And can you manage it? Have you practiced to manage it? You know, one of the things I've got to do is travel across the country and speak to audiences like yourself. But I also got to visit some fire departments and EMS systems and private ambulance companies. And what I find when I talk to the responders is that they're not prepared. They're not prepared to go to that next main event. And I ask them why. They have all kinds of reasons why they're not prepared, whether it be organizationally, individually, whether they don't have the, the resources financially. There are a number of reasons why. And in today's age, it blows my mind that we're not prepared. But then I really took a step back, and I looked at our own department, and I found very similar traits. Do you know what your neighbors have, and how can they help? See, we think about neighbors as the folks that border our communities, but in reality, those neighbors now become 20 miles away, 30 miles away. I can't imagine the scene, the chaotic scene that was just here in Las Vegas, and I can't imagine how they managed. I, I, I know, in, in a sense, what happened in Boston, but I'd love to see the after action report when it all shuffles out, when, when you talk about numbers of four to 500 people, and where do you get resources to manage that? What happens when you get out beyond the, the, the bowl of, of Henderson County and, and Las Vegas. How do you get more resources than that? But if you're a local community, or I saw some, some folks here that live uh, out in the mountains, and you have a, a community that has seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand people, and you have a tour bus rollover. You know, I was talking to uh, a former student of mine who works at uh, the national, one of the national parks. And I said to her, what's your plan if you have a tour bus full of tourists roll over? Where do you get help? And where are they coming from? She said to me, that's a good question. Think about that. Are you really paying attention to what's going on in your communities? I know I wasn't. My role now as a shift commander, I can tell you that we weren't really paying attention. We thought we were, but we really weren't. Think about a population surge event that might happen in your community. Think uh, many of you might have malls in your communities. We have an IKEA. And I can tell you that we were not prepared for the amount of individuals that came to IKEA on a daily basis. Anybody have an IKEA in their in their response area? Have you worked with the local community with the local IKEA folks and talk about the true population surges that come into your town? I'll tell you, when IKEA first opened in our town, we were seeing almost 30,000 people a day. And it didn't really hit me until one day I was working as an engine company officer 
And we responded to IKEA because what IKEA was doing is they were, because we had such a great location just south of Boston, they decided they were going to expand it out to a million square feet. And under, while it was under construction, they ruptured a four inch high pressured gas line underneath the parking garage of the IKEA while it was full at the end of August when all the kids were going back to school and going back to college. And I can tell you when I rounded the corner at the little turn at, at the roundabout and we saw one way in and one way out of Ikea, we knew that in the beginning, we had, had those kind of conversations and people were trying to self-evacuate running for the hills. Because if anybody's ever been to a high pressure gas line rupture, it sounded like a freight train. I mean, it, not only did it sound like a freight train, we were three to 400 yards away and gas was permeating the, the cab of my engine company. And I looked at my driver and he said, I think we got a problem. We had to evacuate that IKEA. That day there were over 10,000 people inside that building when that gas line ruptured. Just, and, and you know, at the end of the day, we were able to shut off the gas and we didn't blow anything up, thank goodness. Uh, but we were close because the gas went through the, ele it elevated through the explosive range inside the building. Why we didn't blow that building up, I'm not really sure. Maybe there was some divine intervention that day, but I'll tell you, we were not prepared to deal with evacuating an Ikea. So when we talk about disasters, we didn't hurt anybody that day, thank goodness, but we had to evacuate this building and no one had really planned for that. Now, we got any people from Texas out there? A Couple of folks? Now see that picture on the bottom? That might be something that is normal in your communities, but I'll tell you right now, if I tried to do that in, uh, in, in the north, we'd have some real uh, discussions about it. But, when you think about not only population surge, but what are the dangers and hazards that we're allowing <laughs> to happen during this parade? That's got bad written all over it, right? Here you have this, you know, 2,000 pound animal with large horns walking down the street. Now I'm sure that that, you know, this guy has done that probably a, a bunch of times in his career, but can you imagine what would happen if that animal got out of control, went into that crowd and started trampling and, and, uh, and and causing all kinds of bad things along that sidewalk. Think of how many 30, 40, 50 people. Are we planning for that? When you have a parade in your community, because it happens all the time, are you really planning for it? When we look at the civil unrest that's gone on in our country, and this isn't a political view at all, please, ladies and gentlemen, that, that's not what I'm here for. But I went back and we started with some of my fellows, we started researching what happened not so much from the political environment, but so much more from the civil unrest side of Ferguson. Ferguson is a town of 21,000 people. Now, a lot of bad actors came and flooded into, the, into Ferguson to cause some civil unrest that, over the time that they had their problems there. But the Ferguson Fire Department and the local hospital that provides EMS, they did as best they could in a really tough situation. How many of you live in communities that have less than 20,000 people? And have you thought about what could happen in your community? You know, we were very fortunate in our community. We had a, uh, we had a police officer who uh, had shot uh, an individual in the chest. And it was a white police officer who shot uh, a, a black man in the chest. And we really thought, we started planning that we were going to have a real bad, uh, bad problem here. It was right after Ferguson. Now, this guy was a bad guy. He tried to stab another poli uh, female police officer and there were some body cams. And the best thing that the police chief did was he really get out in front of this. We immediately went into planning mode. What's going to happen if we have another Ferguson on our hands here in our community? Do you have that kind of communication with your police department? Have you thinking about civil unrest in your communities. Many of you say, ah, it can't happen here. That's the kind of theme that I heard from many individuals as I talked to them from across the country. Oh, it'll never happen here. I'm, do you know the events that are going on? And I'll tell you right now, whether it be Friday night football, a basketball game at your high school, my fire department does not know what every community event is going on in our city. It just doesn't happen. We're not planning for it, and we should be. Well, we might have a generic plan, but do we know when it's happening? And are we paying attention? Are you paying attention in your community? We free, uh, 
what we've seen is that terrorists are going after soft targets. Now that doesn't mean they're going to own small town USA, but it could be somebody local that does that. We saw that in Connecticut, right? Chris had alluded to it earlier. Five minutes prior to any man-made disaster or terror event, the first responders were not thinking that they're going to a disaster today. And I'm sure he didn't think he was, like he said, we didn't think we were going to cut a guy's leg off today. But in our world, in fire and EMS, and even in the hospital, so for the folks that are here in the hospital, I'm sure that you aren't planning for, when you go to work today, I'm going to have to deal with the disaster that comes through our doors. You know, I had a, some wonderful discussions with some physicians, and I know there's some docs in the room. And when you went to medical school, did they teach you about incident command? Did they teach you about managing disasters in your emergency room? And I know in large-scale hospitals like we have in Boston that they have emergency managers, there's really solid plans. But when you move out of those major metro areas into community hospitals, they don't have emergency managers. It might be someone within the hospital that has an interest in it, or it might be the physician in the emergency room at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday who's now going to be in charge of some major disaster that's coming through their doors. And docs, are you prepared for that? When we think about this might be a once in a career moment, and because it is, many folks don't want to train for a once in a career moment. They think it's never going to happen. Whether they train or plan, they think it's never going to happen. And I'm from Rhode Island originally. You might hear my confused Boston, Rhode Island accent here. But the Station Nightclub Fire really defined the metro area of Providence. They'd never gone mutual aid for ambulances outside of the state. That night, not only did 100 people die, but 240 people were injured. And that happened at a fire, a sudden event where 100 people lost their lives. And they were going to communities that were 40 and 50 miles away looking for resources. There were some communities that wouldn't send resources because they were already understaffed and overtasked that they couldn't send resources. They couldn't provide mutual aid. First, they said, we've never sent yeah, we're, we're in Massachusetts. We've never sent anyone all the way to Rhode Island 40 miles away. Some of the EMTs that I talked to didn't even know how to get there. We'll talk a little bit about communication. But see, every system needs a plan to be able to manage that MCI. And do you have that plan in place? I'm not talking about you have to right away have to manage the entire MCI, but you have to at least start to think about how are we going to move forward? Bam, something happens. How are we going to move forward? We look at the plan. Now, Massachusetts has a, a large statewide MCI plan. And I have to say I'm absolutely embarrassed because throughout my entire career, I had never read it. I knew some plan existed, but as a, initially as a, as a paramedic out in the street, I didn't, have, I didn't think I had access to this. Of course, you know, we all do because we can just do a Google search. But Massachusetts has a very large MCI plan. But that information wasn't disseminated to the troops, to the people out in the street, the decision makers. When I first got promoted and went to become a shift commander, my training within the fellowship started to kick in. And I started to thinking about my experience at IKEA and all the bad things that could happen. I went to my chief and I said, hey, chief, you know, I'm really concerned that we haven't even had a discussion about what if one of those uh, rail cars that comes through, what if a commuter rail comes through and, uh, and derails, or hits a car on the way out? Or let's think about in 2004 where the neighboring community had a train crash and 204 people were, had to be transported. What happens if that happens in our community? Do we have a plan? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we got a plan. I said, well, well, I need to see it. Well, it's in the chief's office. It's a true story. I said, okay, chief. said, no disrespect, sir. I said, at 1 AM when the train crashes, and I'm the incident commander that's showing up, and you're not available because you don't live here in town, and you're not coming, and I don't know the plan, am I just going to get back and punt? 
And he said, well, what do you mean? We, we have a plan. I said, yes, but no one knows about it. How many people here have a plan that sits on either in the chief's office or up in the ivory tower somewhere, and you don't get to look at it? And you're the responders. There's some really interesting stuff in this plan. Just a show of hands, how many people have a plan in their community and have never actually seen the written plan? Several folks. Here's the big question. Are you ready to be in command? Now in our national incident management system, who's supposed to take command? The first person who arrives on the scene, right? Now, Many of you might work in ambulances, maybe you're in fire trucks. I will say that the fire service has been practicing this for many years. In engine companies, in battalion chiefs, in ladder companies. But when was the last time some of your fire department ambulances got off and, and called command? Now there are some places that do this phenomenal, right? But I would say the majority of the country does not do this well on an everyday basis. Because we go to, we get complacent in EMS calls. We go to EMS calls and, and we get to an address and who's there, the, the ambulance shows off and they're not giving an on-scene report. They're not thinking about establishing command. You know, in my community we send a basketball team, an engine company with three people and two in the ambulance. Who's in charge? Well, the paramedic's in charge of patient care, the engine company officer is in charge of the scene, but who's actually in command? Well, it's the engine company officer. But when the ambulance shows up five minutes before the engine company, do they get off and say that you know, ambulance one has command? They're not practicing every day. We're, we're going to ask individuals to, um, to now all of a sudden switch gears to a high level event when they've never practiced on going to that event, never actually practiced being in command. Because I guarantee you in this room here, we have a number of folks who have responded to thousands of calls over their career and have never functioned as the IC. And if you've never sat there and felt the weight of command, to do it in an MCI can be very challenging. The size up process usually begins at the worst time in an emergency scene when the needed facts are difficult and if not impossible to gather. Alan Brunacini. Now many of you know we lost Chief Brunacini this week. Ironically, I actually had this slide in my talk prior to his death. But this is an iconic man who had an insight into many things in response and not only taking care of people, but also in the res response modalities that we, we uh, respond out to. And think of this insight here. You're now trying to take command of a situation when you don't have all the information really hard to do, especially with the calamity of a disaster. Norman Schwarzkopf said, when in charge, uh, when, when placed in command, take charge. I've seen this too many times when someone who has a position, when they're supposed to be in charge, they're not in charge. And you arriving as the first person in that ambulance, you're supposed to be in charge. But what we've seen in my research with our fellowship is that Many of the first arriving ambulances in some of these disasters are taking a critical patient and leaving the scene. And why do you think that is? Do you think it's because of lack of training? Do you think it's because of lack of education? What about the emotional side of triage? No one's talked about that. Or I should say, we don't really talk about that. Because what happens when bystanders are begging you to take care of their loved ones? When you first pull up, and despite the enormity of the situation, the only control you can have is one or two patients. Now communication on every disaster becomes as entangled as the wires that we see here. It was a common theme that we heard earlier today that communication is difficult at disasters. It becomes even more difficult when you add multiple agencies who are involved. And do you really play well with others in the sandbox? And I would say that there are communities that do this exceptionally well. And there are others that fight like crazy. But when people's lives are on the line, communication counts. 
Paul Coons has a great illustration here of, of two incident commanders. And when I say incident commanders, this could be you. This could be you as the individual who first steps foot out of their ambulance because you're the first person on scene. And you're going to have to give a radio report. And which person do you want to be? The biggest challenge is that you're not practicing this on an everyday basis. I can tell you as, a, as a, 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 an incident commander, I'm showing off at, at just a routine fire alarm. I show off of a four-story multiple dwelling, uh, type three construction, 30 by uh, 40, and I'm given nothing shown from the outside. I'm given an incident report every single time. That'll de deem where I am and what actions our, our folks are going to take. Are you doing that on a regular basis? Because if you're not, when it counts, and all of a sudden, you're the provider who has to give that radio report. Giving that on-scene report requires that you give a high-level description of that event. What are the hazards that, that are the next in responders going to face? And what kind of problems and what immediate needs do you really have? See, in the fire service, we use the LCAN report. Simple, location of your unit, what conditions are at the scene, what actions and what needs do you have? Just simple as that. Now, when I read the Massachusetts plan, I was kind of shocked to find that they had their own mnemonic. Anybody ever hear of a methane report? Now, my first exposure to the methane report was in that report, but then all of a sudden, as several years went by, and I started seeing it more and more. And in, the, in Europe, in, in the UK, in Ireland, they use a, a methane report. So if, if you're tasked to do this, do you know what your plan calls for? I was blown away that our plan actually said for me as an incident commander, I'm supposed to get on scene, declare an MCI, and give a methane report. So I went back to our, I, went, I was at home and I was reading this plan. I went back into the firehouse and I went to my uh, shift commander and I said, hey, Cap, did, you, ever, you ever hear of a methane report? And he's like, no. I said, well, it's in our disaster plan, in the, the Massachusetts disaster plan. And, and I said, you ever read that? He said, no. I said, oh, OK. So I started asking around. I went to my chief, not the same chief that I have now, but a former chief. And I asked him. And he said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, now I'm worried. I started asking some neighboring communities within Massachusetts. Fire offices, never heard of it because they never read the plan. So if we're not all talking the same language or we have an expectation that something's supposed to happen and it doesn't, how do you recover from that? We have to think about resource management because in the first few minutes, the IC has to make some really, really key decisions. So if you're the first provider pulling up out of that in your ambulance and you open the door and you're getting out and you've established command, you have to think about it. You're establishing a command post. Where are you gonna be located? What kind of game plan do you have? You have to set priorities that actually have benchmarks that are measurable so you know whether you're making progress or not. You have to develop an incident action plan that might include triage and treatment and transport. And then assign those tasks as more units come in. And then hope to God that somebody of higher level rank is going to take command. Because responsibility, and like I said before, the weight of the command is really heavy. And unless you've ever felt it, it's not something you want to feel when you're facing a major disaster. Now, if you're used to it, whole different ballgame. I'm going to let this sink in for a second. Because is the scene really safe? Many of you were taught scene safety in EMT and paramedic school. And I teach a lot of paramedic students. And many of them we didn't have as EMT students in our school. And the first thing they do is they come in and they go, Scene safe, BSI. And they do get the jazz hands going on. First, I want to know who's teaching that. But I really had an epiphany uh, several years ago. We set up a scenario. We do a lot of scenarios at our school. Because I, I think that scenario-based learning is really what makes, uh, 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 helps the student bridge the gap between ed the education they're getting and actually field provider. And if you ever get some wonderful paramedic students who have a little bit of street uh, uh, experience, they make incredible actors. And so do my children, by the way. They've been involved in EMS for years um, growing up. And I'll tell you, my daughter Kira can be the, the, you know, she can get this Sandra Burry Award. But anyway, 
We had two. I set up the, we set up the scenario where uh, one, one student was wearing a hoodie that day. He was going to be this individual who had been stabbed in the, in the abdomen. And his girlfriend was going to be very convincing that he needed help. And two of our paramedic students came in, and they're carrying their bags. And, and we say to them, OK, the, first and foremost, the, the, it's, a, it's a reported uh, fight. And they didn't know they were going to a stabbing. The police aren't available right now because there's a bank robbery on the other side of town and the police are not there. We wanted to see what would happen. So the paramedic students came in and they entered the room. And the first thing, this, this young lady, she really sold it. She's like, please help my, help my boyfriend, he's been stabbed. Please help my boyfriend, he's been stabbed. Well, one of the EMTs says, oh, the scene's not safe. And he convinces his partner that the best thing they can do is to back out and go outside the door. I sat there shocked. And I said, geez, we failed. We have failed. And many of you were taught scene safety by sitting in a classroom and not actually determining whether the scene's safe. And what's safety mean? Is it relatively safe? Were they able to take that person, put them in their ambulance, go down the street? And, and really what they lacked was, they lacked models to help make decisions. So when we think about what's going on now in the, in the active shooters and the disasters that we're facing, and we heard uh, Dr. Eastman this morning talk about going into the hot zone or even into the warm zone under the Hartford Consensus. Are you talking to your people about that? See, Dr. Pierre Cali, who is the director of the SAMU in Paris, made a statement last week, and I actually put it in because I felt it really was important. He said that people are dying in the hot zone. How are first responders preparing and planning to enter the hazard zone? How are you doing that today? If you had an active shooter in your, in your town, in your community, are you still waiting around the corner for the police to completely clear the scene? Despite that we have research to understand it, the Hartford consensus came out and said, we might be thinking about different ways. You need to be working with your law enforcement agency. I know in our community, we actually did some active shooter training with our police and talked about how they're going to go in and clear, we're going to go into the warm zone. Now, that's a really interesting discussion because I had this discussion in, in not only my department, but some other places in private ambulance companies that do 911. One thing that we're not talking about when we talk about going into the hazard zone, see, as a firefighter, I raised my hand and took an oath. And I know that if something happens to me, in my community, while I'm risking my life to save, save others, that my family is going to be taken care of. That me as an individual, yeah, I might be dead or I might be really injured, but my wife is going to get my pension, my kids are going to go to college, we're going to get the public safety uh, death benefit, but also the town has a, a half a million dollar policy that's going to take care of my family. I know that when I put myself in harm's way, that my family is okay. Do all of you know that? So when we're talking about risking our lives, and I'm certainly willing to do it because that's my job, but have we had that discussion? So with the Hartford consensus comes out and says those things, and I agree with them. I think we should be going to the hazard zone. But I don't live and work in your communities. I don't know your situation. I don't know if your town administrator, your mayor, or city, city manager is going to take care of you. So now this is kind of a convoluted way to get to triage, but I think it's important that we took this journey. See, what's the best method? And we look up there, we see some methods that are out there, and you know what we've really found in research? There's no one best way. Many of you were taught in EMT and paramedic school, start triage. The start triage came out of California in the 80s in Hogue Hospital in Newport, uh, Newport News Fire Department. They come up with a way to sort of accident victims. But one thing they weren't considering was 300, 400, 500 people in an event. There was no resource management in triage. Think about that. You're making decisions based on the patient's condition. You're not, base, you're not making uh, decisions based on the amount of resources that you have. You know, I've always thought to myself and, and through our research, if I have 10 red, red patients, who goes first? Now, many will argue that in secondary triage, we'll sort that out, right? But 
in reality, how do pre-hospital responders conduct triage? And through my research, I will also tell you that many large-scale MCIs triage becomes incredibly difficult. The traditional triage that we have seen or been taught doesn't work. The next question really should be, who should be the triage officer? Who should lead the triage? There's two major discussions that are going on about triage and who should lead that. Either the most experienced provider or the less experienced provider. The less experienced provider is making uh, uh, less neural decisions about the individual. They're going down a, a, a algorithm and checking boxes based on what they see. The more experienced provider is using things like prime, rec uh, prime recognition decision making in, in Gary Klein's theory, or they're using Kahneman's uh, thinking fast and slow theory in phase one and phase two learning. So when you, when you think about who should be doing this, we have to say to ourselves, what's in the best interest of the patient? Is it the less skilled provider? And we never have a discussion about, well, once you're the triage officer and you're running around doing triage, should we replace you? Because maybe you're good enough to start. And I don't mean that in any disrespect to any providers. But see, if those are my family members in my community, I want the best care. I want the person who can make the best decision in the high level thinking because there's an emotion decisions that go along with triage. When you come to an individual and you have to put a black tag on them and move forward, there's an emotional response to that. And if you're not experienced and you haven't dealt with that, the repercussions of that can be challenging for a provider. Do they have the intestinal fortitude to do it? In the Boston bombing, two things happen. The first person that got to the Richards boy that was killed in that uh, in that bombing was an off-duty firefighter. And then everything, and he was an EMS instructor too, and everything he's ever been taught, everything he ever teaches is that when you have no pulse and you're not breathing, and with the amount of folks that they had to take care of, you wouldn't waste the resources because you really were trying to save the most lives. But because it was a child, and I've talked to him, the instinct took over, and he began CPR, and others helped him. So what we found is that, wait a minute, in our research, no, even some of the most experienced providers won't make those great decisions. I'm not saying it was good or bad. I was not there, and I'm not judging the man whatsoever. That was some hard decisions to make, especially when that young boy's family was right there with him, and his, and his sister lost her leg, and his mother lost an eye, and his father lost some of his hearing. So those are really, really tough decisions, but we're not training individuals in EMS to make those really, really hard decisions when it counts. See, you don't earn your medal on the battlefield until you've actually been to the battlefield. You have no idea how you're going to respond until you actually get there. In 2004, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, sponsored a mass casualty uh, triage project. This was a large project, and they looked at all those types of triage uh, that we saw before, they looked at all of these and they started comparing them. And what they couldn't find was that one was better than the other. And because of that, they came up with a different model, the SALT mass casualty triage. Be honest, how many people in the room have actually seen this? Just a handful. It starts off with sorting. Patients that are walking, they're, they're, they're third to be even looked at. The first thing that they do is say, if you, if you need help, wave your hand or arm. Well, we know that those people have purposeful movement. They're conscious because they can hear me. And anyone else that doesn't move, we should go to them first. See, in start triage, how were you taught to do triage? Where do you start? Where you land, right? Wherever you are is where you start. But what, is that really, what did, what did Dr. Pia Kelly say? People are dying in the hazard zone. If we're 50 yards from the hazard zone and we're starting now and maybe you're doing an ever increasing concentric circle, that's a paramedic uh, uh, joke, but, but however you're doing your, your method of triage, because the start triage system says wherever you land, you start triage. Is that the right thing to do? What we're finding, especially during an active shooter event, is it might not be 
Because the people that are closest to you are people who have gotten away further. Wherever that event is, should we be going to that event? Now, I'm not here to tell you to change your practices. Because those are up to your organizations, and I think that, but I want you to think about this and take back to your organizations that are we really functioning the way we should in today's environment? So looking at a model like this, you know, it, it talks about LSI, life-saving interactions. Control major hemorrhage, open the airway, chesty compression, auto-injectives or seed murny if that's an issue. But it has this whole uh, model that quickly sorts people. Now, I heard, I heard it over here. I asked uh, uh, earlier about where do we start. And someone said we start with the green patients. We make an announcement. Every, uh, you all were taught this, right? If anyone can walk, get up and move over to the casualty collection area over here. Is that correct? Most of you were taught that? Well, first and foremost, my experience at MCIs, I've been to, I've been to several of them, is anybody who can get up and walk has already moved. Right? And the people that are left behind are the ones who are helping loved ones. Or they're willing to help. And I think that should be the next discussion that we have. Who can help? Where do we get force multipliers? And we've seen them in every major event recently in our country, where, whether it be active shooter or sub Boston bombing, we're proximity responders. That's just a term I made up, by the way. Proximity responders, people are in the area who are police, fire, off-duty personnel, nurses, someone who has Boy Scout training, any first aid training, or even if they don't have first aid training, they're willing to help. I, I was, uh, there was a study done about willingness to help, and 98% of all the individuals that responded to the survey said that they would be willing to stop bleeding with a, for a loved one. So they must love them enough that 90, I don't know who the 2% are, but 98% of the folks said, we'll help. 84% of the folks said, we'll help strangers. That's a really large number. 84%, and we've seen it over and over. So really, we should be asking, not so much who could get up and walk over here, not saying we don't need to get casualty collection areas, we need to be able to sort people, that's important. But initially, if you're the first responder, you might ask, who can help? And you might bring those people along, giving them quick, easy direction on hold, how to hold pressure, and get them a tourniquet, give them quick instruction, and you're moving on. So can they help? Some of the triage lessons that we learned from the Boston Marathon. Traditional triage was incredibly challenging for the first responders that were there. Now, the, the terrorists that hit that, the marathon that day, if they had gone to the beginning instead of the end, the impact of that disaster would have been so much greater. You know, Boston has six trauma centers within a mile, six level one trauma centers within a mile of the Boston bombing. Incredible amounts of resources there. Not only did they have this planned event, um, for years, Boston EMS, Boston Police, the State Police, Boston Fire, they have been planning for these types of events. And, and just in the marathon alone, they see hundreds of patients come into the medical tents. So this happened just a few hundred yards away from the medical tents. And really what happened is most of the triage occurred inside the medical tents in, in what they de really deemed the, the casualty collection areas. People were just bringing them in. The doctors and the nurses and the paramedics and the EMTs were helping me do triage. And you see where it said the green patients self-evacuated. When a bomb goes off, people are going to run. If they can run, they're running. And when the second bomb went off, they're going to run faster. It's true. And most patients that they encountered immediately were all red patients. And if you've seen some of the horrific pictures like one here, you see the amount of blood that was left on the sidewalk. That's what they were facing that day. And what they found was the triage tag system they had in place in Boston was really hard to work with. How many of you have the triage tags that has a little plastic folder on the outside that you have to pull it out, you deem what it is, you put it back? What they found is they couldn't get them back in the sleeves. And the sleeves actually have the attachments, the elastic bands that would attach to the patients. It became really challenging, so they, uh, uh, many of them abandoned the process. So under stress, in extremis, the individuals who were doing the triage 
we're struggling just getting the triage tags on. Think about that level of frustration. Some of the recent lessons and, and takeaways that we heard last week in, in Boston, that they're looking at different triage models in Paris and in Brussels and in London, and going to look at where you have either absolute emergencies or relative emergencies. They sort victims based on that. And they're also now implementing damage control. The damage control principles that they learned in Afghanistan and Iraq on the wounded that were there, they're now implementing in some of their, their care in Europe. And we're doing that too here in the United States. There were some actual discussions about go, you know, putting balloons in and blocking off uh, uh, the aorta for major hemorrhage in casualty collection areas out in Paris. Now, could we do that as EMS folks? Of course not. However, we might have good uh, uh, relationships with some of the physicians in the room who are going to respond out and come to us and help. Now, when we think about uh, damage control, one of the problems that we're seeing is multi-location, multiple modality events. We have rolling disasters, multiple command areas. We saw it in Paris, we saw it in Brussels. We had multiple events around their communities. And not only did they have uh, multiple events, they had blast injuries, they had high caliber, you know, high velocity gunshot wounds. That you know, one of the interesting things that happened in Europe was many of the physicians and the ER physicians and surgeons who had not served in the war had never encountered such massive wounds because they don't really have a lot of gun problems in Europe. Dr. Kobe Pegle had one of the best statements of the conference. He said the worst is always possible. And I truly believe that. We see really major events and what bad things can happen to great people, but it could be worse. Because we ha how are we preparing for a sea Bernie event? What happens if sarin gas goes off in one of your communities? Have you prepared for that? One of the common themes of the recent events was fake news. Meaning that a lot of information that was coming out of the media was not correct during these events. A good friend of mine, Sean Britton, I'll give him a shout out, once said that the media is like a dog. If you don't feed them, they'll go pick through your trash. And I think if you, there's no meat on the bone for them, they're, they're going to go find someone to talk to. And I think that's critically important that one of the things that we're thinking about in the very beginning of this event is are the information that's coming in and being sent out through social media correct? You know, many of you might have your own social media account. I know in our, in our community, our police department, our fire department, we have our own Facebook page and Twitter account. And when there's major incidents going on, that's a way for us to communicate with, the, directly communicate with the community. And I think that's important that you think about that and, and, and have someone who, who really could manage that. And one of the biggest things about triage that came out of our research is that leadership matters. Leadership matters. The decisions in the first few minutes will help determine the success of the operation. Failure is not an option when people's lives are on the line. And just remember, folks, help's on the way. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and for your support of the EMS Nation podcast. We very much appreciate you listening in and making the conscious decision to upgrade your skill set and deliver the highest quality care to your patients. We also value your feedback and would love for you guys to leave a review on iTunes so that we can continue to share this podcast with all the pre-hospital colleagues on this planet. And let people know regardless of what your favorite listening style is we are available on itunes the android platform and we also recently uh, joined spotify so please tune in to the next episode of ems nation here is a salutation from the pre-hospital trauma committee of the national association of emts i'm andy pollack medical editor for PHTLS 9th edition. My full-time day job as chairman of orthopedics at the University of Maryland. 
but I'm also the medical director for the Baltimore County Fire Department and a special deputy U.S. Marshal. I can tell you that we are clearly looking forward to the upcoming publication of the ninth edition of the PHTLS textbook. Our authors have been hard at work editing the prior version and adding new content to ensure that we have thorough coverage of all the topics that are important to pre-hospital care providers at all levels and that we've clearly established the evidentiary basis for the statements made and the conclusions drawn. We'll be rolling out the new edition at the World Trauma Symposium in Nashville this coming October, and we hope you can be there for this exciting event. My name is uh, Jesse Bidlow. I'm an anesthesiologist and uh, EMS physician from Switzerland. I'm in charge for the airway chapter of uh, an ninth edition of PHTLS. Actually, I think it's very important because there has, has been a lot coming out in the last years about airway management and not only in advanced airway stuff but we have come to recognize the importance of basic airway management so we have a lot in store not only for uh, big time ALS providers but for each and every EMT on the street so I'm very very excited about this ninth edition we're going to, to present in Nashville. I'm Alex Eastman. I'm the medical director of PHTLS, and uh, it is a real pleasure to follow in the footsteps of some giants and friends who have filled this role before me. The theme for the 2018 World Trauma Symposium is New Threats, New Solutions. And at a time when the world seems a bit uncertain, when EMS providers are being asked not only to face novel threats, but to respond to them, Uh, We felt like it was our responsibility to bring a conference together that helps not only introduce the ninth edition of the PHTLS program, but brings you, the EMS provider at all levels, a better ability to respond to the novel threats that are out there. So I hope that we will see you in Nashville. We'll promise you unparalleled program that uh, I think you'll enjoy. So with that, um, I'd say thank you for listening, and we'll look forward to seeing you in Nashville. This is the Pre-Hospital Trauma Committee wishing everyone a safe tour.